Welcome to the AfriMind Podcast. Your podcast for courage and inspiration from Africa. My name is Lena Wendt and my vision is to tell stories that have the power to change your life. How are you doing? I feel so happy. <laughs> you feel so happy? Why? Oh, yes, yes. Just seen you for a very long time, you know. Same to you. It's so good to see you and it's so easy. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Where Technology has made it possible. Are you at your home or where are you? Uh, I'm in part of our office, actually. You know, over here, it's very difficult to really get a very quiet environment. Is so it? I'm just trying my best to get the best <laughs> of places for this interview. Wow, it's so good to yeah. see you. I'm very like, oh, it's so good. <laughs> it's like as if you were next to me. <laughs> you know, that feeling where you want to hug and you cannot hug. Yeah. <laughs> oh, Jesus. I'm very, very, very proud and very glad to introduce my dear friend Emma to everyone here. I'm very glad that we made that happen, that we are sitting here talking to each other. And actually why I think everyone should get to know you is because to me, you are one of the most inspiring people I met. And oh, wow. uh, I guess Thank that's you. a big compliment. <laughs> a <laughs> huge I'm... compliment, actually, and I appreciate it. <laughs> and I think one, one point that makes you for me so special is that you come from Ghana, a country where I would say a lot of people from the Western world wouldn't expect someone um, so open-minded, so very well educated, so self-reflected like you. And I feel like a lot of people in our side of the of the world, like we could really <laughs> learn a lot from you. And this is why I actually want people to hear from you, want people to hear your story and get inspired. <laughs> sure. <laughs> uh, thank you for offering me the opportunity. You know. I, I see this as a, a normal conversation with you because we have always talked about these things yeah. and, uh, anytime we, we get to, to chat. Let me tell everyone who is listening how we met because I find it also very interesting because I've visited your country but I didn't meet you at that time and you've been visiting my country, like my home yes. country and I, we have met there. No, no. we guys, we met in Ivory Coast. Ivory Coast, yeah, totally different country. <laughs> yeah, totally different country, totally different language. And yes. um, yeah, we met through a friend. You were traveling with him. Um, you're part of his organization. You're part of his band. Actually, tell please the people, who are you? What's your name? Where are you from? And what are you doing in your current life? Uh, okay. Um, briefly, my name is uh, Emmanuel Derry Kunsane. I am 33 years. I will be 34 soon. Um, I come from a, a place called Jirapati in the Upper West region of Ghana. I'm a nutritionist by profession. I currently work at the St. Joseph Health Center in Calva, which is in the Savannah region, not my home region, actually. Uh, what else? I like to play volleyball. I like music, both singing and listening to it. And when I say music, every type of music in this world. I, I just I just enjoy every type of music. I like traveling. And uh, I like what we are doing now, being on social media and what have you. <laughs> I like the internet so much. I'm a, I'm a Christian by faith, and I'm married with uh, two kids. And I'm actually expecting the third one soon. Oh, what? Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Wow, <laughs> well, what news, I'm so happy yes. and to be honest, <laughs> you, I think it will be amazing for the world to to have another like child of yours because sure. I'm expecting it to be to be like his father, like a very wise little child. <laughs> Thank you, Lena. <laughs> <laughs> yes. um, uh, that's just a, a bit about me. Uh, if you want to hear about my family, uh, yeah. I come from a very humble family. Uh, actually, we were 16 siblings you know, in Africa. Yes, with myself inclusive. We practiced the extended family system here. So my dad actually had about five women. Mm -hmm. He was legally married to uh, three of them. 
but the other two, he, he just had children with them. So together we were 16 siblings, uh, seven females, nine males. Unfortunately, uh, three of them passed on, uh, one male, two females. And then we are currently 13 now alive. But when you come to my nuclear family, my, mo my mother's side, we were six siblings, four males, two females. Unfortunately, two passed on, uh, one male, one female, and we are now left with four. We are three guys and then our only sister. So that's a bit of background from my, my, my family side. Yeah. Was your mom one of the legally married women or was she the one? Yes, yes. She was one of the, actually the second wife, the second legally married wife. There's, there's a very interesting story to this. Uh, according to my elderly siblings, my dad's first wife, was very, she was actually very stout and strong. And uh, if you were not strong and you came to the house, she could easily rival and beat you and suck you. So the women were scared until when my mom came. My mom was there, there in Africa. We have someone who say Fiero. She used to be so afraid. She doesn't know how to fight. So she's always, I mean, I'm out of trouble. So if you are shouting, I mean, I have given up. You've defeated me. That kind of posture, if you know what I mean. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so she was that type. And then I think her rival accommodated her because she wasn't forthcoming. I want to fight you. I want to rival you and all that. So they stayed perfectly. Yes. And the last, the last legal wife, actually, was an, a kind of inherited woman. Let me put it that way. In our culture, when your elder brother passes on and your, the, his wife is there, you as a younger brother can marry her in addition. So the third wife was actually that kind of wife from my father's side. Mm -hmm. Yes. Interesting, huh? It is very interesting. And I <laughs> wonder, I, for me personally, as a woman, I wonder how that works and kind of a case of jealousy or who can see the husband. And uh, also, I wonder as a child, if you have a father that has so many children, like, it, it, can the father be there for you? Like, were you close to your father? This was really difficult. Uh, we were close to him as and when he was available. It got to a point uh, when I was becoming conscious of things around me. My dad was actually not around. He was in uh, this Savannah region, part of the Savannah region. He was a traditional healer, or some people would say a herbalist. Mm -hmm. And then he was into this uh, peasant farming. So the land in our side was not very fertile, so he had to move to Savannah region with his first wife, actually. So I grew up knowing that I was just with my mom and my other siblings, but he used to visit. In a year, he could visit like two, three times. So anytime he was available, we were so happy. We had the fun moments. Then he leaves and goes back to his first wife. So it was like, like that until along the line. I think I was in upper primary or so before he eventually packed fully and then came. So the complete family were now together. Wow. So a greater part of my upbringing was with my mom more than my dad. Uh, sometimes it's very difficult to say this, but uh, it's when you, when you tell the truth to the world, people learn from it. I mean, we have always said this, and that honesty is very key if we want the world to change, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, growing up, when I was growing up um, with only my mom, I actually felt love in the immediate environment. My mother was the kind that, uh, excuse me to say, when the mad people are passing. Our house is by the roadside. So every now and then you see these uh, mentally challenged people passing by. People don't want to associate with them. Some could be violent. We, we heard horrible stories of them killing people and what have you. But on the contrary, my mom, when they pass by, my mom will invite them and serve them food. You know the annoying part, Lena, at the time, Sometimes he used our own bowl to serve these guys. And we were so, you know, we're so angry with her. <laughs> but then when you complain, she will just tell you, hey, you know what? I just look at this boy or I look at this girl and I imagine she could be my own. And that is why I'm doing that for, I'm doing it for you, actually. She used to tell us she was doing that for us because she has no idea how long she's going to live and how any of us is going to end up. She's not wishing that we end up with mental problems but if in case one day you become like that someone else somewhere might also show you sympathy because the world doesn't care about them 
So with that thing, there was a lot of love in the house. But um, when my father finally came around, you know, these marital issues, we were too young to understand always quarrels and sometimes actually beatings, which we witnessed. So things changed dramatically. All of a sudden from that serene and lovely environment to this turbulent home, it was rather funny. One expects the quarrels always be coming from rivals. But my mom and my stepmother did not have that at all. We didn't see anything like that between them. They were always cool, but the issue was always with my dad, you know, superimposing his strength on them and chasing and beating them every now and then. <laughs> so it, it was a mixed environment growing up. We saw, we saw the laugh part of it, and then we saw the turbulent part of it. And I think that together, the two together, even though it was unfortunate, we wish it had not happened, but it has formed us in a way, especially me. I learned a lot from it, and then I kept building myself through that experience. How old so were you at that time? How old were you when your father came back to the house? I should have been around seven, eight years thereabout, yes. Wow. Yes, if, I, if my guess is right, yeah. So how did you feel that change from, you said, like a very loving and caring home? I mean, your mom seemed to be very smart too, to then have the man, I mean, a man energy permanently at the house yeah. that brings also, you said, like very violent, but I guess when a man comes back into a house that he hasn't lived before, he has to make his space, right? Sure, sure, it sure. feels for me like he has to show them the strong side. So, so sure. how did that energy shift feel for you? Like, what did that do to you? I mean, it was really difficult. I will not hide this. It was really, really, really difficult. And if I should confess, along the line, I was actually developing hatred for my dad because, you know, this bonding with your mom, anybody that wants to mess with that woman, you, you can understand. Yeah. So uh, there were moments I felt if I had these muscles at that time, man, it was not going to be easy, you know. I felt like I could rise up and confront this man and teach him who the real men are. But uh, all I could do was to just cry. And then uh, all along, at that tender age, this thing kept ringing in my head. Hey, when you grow up, try to correct what your dad is doing now by not showing that kind of negative masculinity to uh, any woman. Mm -hmm. So that thing had always been in my head, even at a very tender age. I was always like, if when I grow, I will, I'm not going to do this. I'm going to use the opportunity to correct what my dad was doing. And it was purely ignorance, you know. He wasn't, I'm sure if my dad was alive, unfortunately, he, they are both late. If he were alive today, uh, he, he would have looked back and regretted. I'm, I'm very sure. Because at the latter part of his life, he also saw that, man, there was nothing good in that. It was mostly under the influence of alcohol or, I don't know, something. Mm -hmm. Yes. So uh, it was a very difficult moment. It was a very difficult moment. And that nearly affected my education in a way. and then some of my siblings as well. How is that in Ghana? When you grow up, are you teached or did you get like, did you learn how to talk about feelings? Like, did you learn expressing your feelings? No, there was nothing like that. I mean, you could just cry. I remember on one occasion when uh, my mom actually packed that she was leaving. She was, she had had enough of the beatings and she wanted to relocate to her father's house. So it was only my sister who was a bit grown at the time, my elder sister. She was just crying and following this woman. We we're all crying and following her. So she went and sat by the roadside waiting for a means of transport. Then as we sat there crying, she just looked at us and she couldn't cope than to come back to the house. So she kept on telling us that, hey, guys, you were the reason why I'm hanging on here. Because if I leave, you are going to become, I don't know your, your future and your fate. But eventually everything stopped. My dad changed when he realized that it wasn't, there was nothing being gained from it. But to express yourself honestly, there was nothing like that. It is now that that culture is creeping in small, small, but in our society here, there was nothing like a child expressing yourself. We were actually beaten on some circumstances that we had. If we had a chance to explain ourselves, they could realize that we were not wrong, but you just have to endure the beating because you don't have a say as a kid. And you dare not, especially to talk about things that happen among the adult class. Man, you could even be labeled as a wizard. Because as a child, it's none of your business. Yours is to just watch. 
and keep mute. They will tell you when you grow, you understand. In the hindsight, I still felt proud in my dad because that's my father. You know, that man factor in your life, you can never take it away. He was a great man by all standards. Great man with his name out there. You know, very smart man. He never stepped foot in classroom, but he was very smart. It's my dad who actually taught us basic English. Names of things like scorpion, chameleon, frogs, and it was my dad. But he never stepped foot in any, I mean, official classroom. There was nothing like a formal education in his life. So you can imagine. So it was just the one the downside of him that I'm telling, but he was a great man. How was it at the time? Did you go to school? How was the education system? Like, uh, did you, what did you learn? How did you learn? There was this perception in the history of our family. They never believed in edu formal education. Like anything foreign, they saw it as an enemy. Uh, even until recently, my hometown, to, to use something that was metallic was forbidden. So like you cannot use uh, the iron sheets that we use to roof a building. It was forbidden in my hometown, wow. according to the stories. Yes. What so were you can the, imagine. Why, why could you not use anything iron? Uh, I think it was uh, traditionally, you know, those days, it was all fightings and wars and what have you. Mm -hmm. So the, the story has it that our forefathers had the powers to disarm you if you came in to attack them with any metallic thing. They had that tendency, there's the powers to disarm you. You mm -hmm. cannot, your metal cannot function there. A gun cannot explode. I mean, if you ride in a motorcycle and you are entering there, it might cease. These are the stories we hear. So mm -hmm. I think it was something in relation to that, that they don't want anything metallic. And they felt anything foreign might come to sort of contaminate their culture. So they saw education as one of those contaminants. So I, in person, I was never put in school. I was just there as a kid. Do you know what really sent me to school, Lena? To surprise you, uh, there was this uh, this thing they call wheat. It's a cereal. Ah, okay, like a grain. Uh huh. Grain, yes. Mm -hmm. There, there was a there. Was it US eight? I was a, a kid at the time. There was they used to write US eight on them. They used to provide that for basic schools. So my school, my village school, was a beneficiary. And the kids used to go to the school, so they would cook this wheat and serve them in bowls. So as the kids were passing, I saw them eating this stuff, which I didn't know it, what it was. Because at the time, the grains I knew was rice, the guinea corn, the millet, maize. But I saw this and it was different. It was like rice, but brownish. So all the time when I beg, then the kids, they would deny me. They would not give me. After all, you are not going to school. You don't supposed to taste that. So I got up one, one hot afternoon and I beg, and they did not give me. So I went and confronted my mom. I was like, hey. Tomorrow, I'm going to take my bath, pick my bowl. I'm going to school. I must taste that food. <laughs> yes, it sounds funny, huh? But that's what sent me to school, actually. I was never sent to school. So the following day, as I, I, I told my mom, I actually got up, bath, took my, I took the biggest bowl because I, I, I thought when you go there, they will serve you according to the size of your bowl. So I took the biggest bowl and I, I, off I went to school. I joined my colleagues and I went. So that's it. That has ended me today, having this interview with you. I couldn't have been able to speak English. <laughs> that is so funny because actually also you said that nutrition brought you to school and now you're sure. a nutritionist. Yes. Just wow. by coincidence. How old were you when you when you went to get your weed? <laughs> uh, I think I should have been the six years by then. Wow. Should've and your mom had then. no problem to send you to school. Actually, it was never a question of money or school fees. It was just uh, leave. Was just, at, at the time, there was, there was like there was nothing like, and any, anything that could attract them that put your child in school. There was nothing like we have teachers, so they are living good. Like everything was fine at the time. With, when you farm, you get enough harvest. There's enough food. You eat. You are healthy. There was no. The problems of today did not exist at the time. So, like, they saw no need, you, if you understand what I mean. It's not like today that we have, as we are here working, every parent, they see us, they like it. They want their kids to also become like that. At the time, there was nothing like that. By the time I go to classics, actually, I was I always leading in all the subjects in the class. Because actually, there was a day I somebody beat me in a subject with just two marks. I think I scored, uh, was it 85%? And the person scored 87%. Guess what happened? 
his elderly siblings from the community heard of it and they came to the school premise and carried this guy's shoulder high. They were singing and celebrating around the campus. <laughs> because that boy had been able to beat me in a subject. <sighs> so at that point, some of these things were beginning to make sense to me that you can be a great person. Yeah. But then there was a very unfortunate thing that happened. And I might share this for people, both <clears throat> sorry, parents, kids, and teachers to learn. When I was in primary six, something happened and that nearly kept my spirit down. I fought that thing seriously. Anytime I sent a book to school, within three, four days, then they would steal it. And you know, from the background, things were not very good in my home. So sacrificing to buy books was really difficult. So every time I would get beaten, my elder brother by then was ahead, but he was very harsh and he could beat us to pulp. <laughs> Yes, as a correction, a correctional measure. It was accepted at the time, and it really helped us. <laughs> Otherwise, I in person would have gone wayward. I used to be stubborn sometimes. So the beatings were so much. One one day I went to school with a, they bought they had bought me a brand new book. We went for a first break before we could come back. This book was stolen. Man, I was with two friends. I was so furious. I said today I'm not going to receive these beatings at home. I, I've had enough. So. I just also grabbed the next table. There was a brand new book there. I did not even check whose name was on it. I just tore the cover off and wrote my name inside the book. <sighs> so my two friends were like, no, don't do it. They will call you a thief. And I was like, no, but they have been stealing my books. And you two are here. So it's not stealing. I will also pick it and say, no, otherwise they will kill me today. Yes. So I, I insisted and I actually took the book. So the one of them went back and uh, reported to the girl, the owner of the book. He had seen the name. I was just acting out of anger. So I didn't even check the name, not knowing. She was even a girl that I was very friendly with. Mm -hmm. So in effect, it was a friend's, another friend's book I had picked like that. So the girl came, apparently crying, where's my book, where's my book? They went and reported to authorities. At that point, I was feeling bad. I could not bring back the book because if I bring it out, it would mean I'm a thief, right? Yeah. So I left it in my bag. No, no, one of my friends went up, went back and hinted the school SP that the book was in my bag. So they came in to search and they went straight to my bag first and they saw the book. So that was it. Everybody was calling me a thief. Wow. Apart from my class teacher at the time, one Mr. Kujo, he called me to his house and told me, hey, relax. You know what? You are the most brilliant child and focus on that. This is just a mishap and don't let it weigh you down. Wow. But trust me, Lena, I fought this really hard. It was very difficult. But you know, as now that I'm grown that I could I can analyze what really happened at the time. My family had a role to play because anytime my book was stolen, they kept the blame on me, they beat me up. Mm -hmm. So this particular time I, I wanted to dodge this beating. I went and rather took a friend's book without even checking whose name was on it. Mm -hmm. Just to pay back those who have been stealing my book. I went and picked the wrong one. And now it has resulted in me being a thief. So the, the teacher, that's why I was saying a lot of people can learn from this. The teacher actually kept me moving. As a child, like what, what made you happy? What made you sad? I was always like the smallest, but the, the leader. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I've, I had so much joy in that. Anytime I was with friends playing at will. But when it was time for me to to to, to do certain things like in the house, they want me to come and do house chores under strict rules because my elder brother was really very harsh. Eh? <laughs> he had anger issues. So if you don't do the right thing, you discipline you. And when I say discipline, you know what it means in the context I explained earlier. They are using the whip. Oh. Yes. Yes. So I was happy when I was satisfied and with friends and playing outside. And I was sad if there was no food. Along the line, food, even basic needs was an issue in the same house that we used to have enough food. Those were the saddest moments of my life. At the time, I was actually from high school waiting to go to tertiary. So you know what? I was just an adult at the time. And by, things, by then, my mom was late. My dad was late. My stepmom was late. We we're just the siblings living in the house, man, with only one stepmother. It was tough. 
why did yes. your mom die and why why did your siblings die i think my mom it was severe malaria at the time if i can remember very well because at the time the disease they used to refer to as fever in our local parlance was this malaria i only now that i'm getting to know that it was those conditions but she was being kept at home and being treated with herbs and that was what they did almost all the time so at the time there was this teacher friend of hers when she came and then advised my dad to take my mom to hospital but i think by then it was too late they couldn't rescue her so she eventually died my father at the time you know my elder brothers were there taking care of my father in the hospital so I cannot tell what the diagnosis was. And at the time, you don't ask questions. When you go to the hospital, they just give you prescriptions, go and buy the so that's all. You don't ask to know. So if I can't tell what actually led to my dad's sickness. My other siblings, one also died from tuberculosis. You know tuberculosis? Yeah. Yes. I was in high school when she died. But the second one, a very interesting story there again. He is the reason why I am called Derry. The Derry has a meaning. I don't know if I ever told you this. There is a reincarnated child. Uh -huh. It means you were born, you died, and you came back with some features resembling the person who died. So they believe you are the one who has come back. Wow. Yes. So he was he died at an at a very early age, I think as an infant or so. Mm -hmm. So before my mother gave birth to me. So for him, I cannot tell. I was not existing at that time. He actually died before I was born. And according to my family, I have come back with the same features. So, <laughs> yes, the, the only thing, the only difference they used to say was that that baby was far cuter than I am. So I used to cry. They used to insult me that I'm ugly and I would cry. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Families with such children, they believe we are special kids. We have special abilities. So when I, when I decided to go to school on my own and I was doing very well, my parents were like, we are not surprised because that's what we expect from you. You are a special person. Did that put you also in a lot of pressure? I mean, if people already expect you to be special, then also when your friends see you as someone that needs to be respected, I guess as a child, that does a lot to you, right? It's a question of ego. Like, how do I handle it if everyone holds me up like a, like a little prince, kind of like? And also sure. the family has so high expectations. I mean, what does that do to you? Uh, you know, it massages your ego to let you know that, yes, you are special among the rest. So always strive, strive to be the best. So that was the motivating aspect of it. Does it also bring you like in a <clears throat> difficult position? In the most African countries, I know people really believe in the magic, right? So if people uh, look at you as a sure. wizard, is it more a problem of jealousy or bringing you also into danger or does it protect you? No, I think uh, uh, in my case, it wasn't that much. Usually we have classes of this uh, witchcraft thing that I'm talking about. Usually we have those that they think they are negative. They have negative spirits that they can use to harm people. Mm -hmm. My case wasn't like that. It is just like, oh, he has something special that is making him intelligent. That is all. So mm -hmm. that negative aspect and pressure was not on me like that. Yes. But if it is the other way, we know of other children when they label them as spiritual children, they feel nobody wants you to come close to their kids because you might infect them. Yeah. It's also there. But my case was not like that. Mine was different. Yes. You said that there was a time that was really, really rough, like when you were grown up, when your mom was dead, when your sure. siblings were dead, when your father was dead. How did you handle the situation? How did you carry that responsibility? How did you still believe in the good of life and keep fighting? Like, how did you pull yourself out of this? Yeah, sure. So this brings me to my junior high education period. That was the period the whole thing started. So actually, one of my down moments too during that period was when we were writing what we call mock exams. We're about to write the basic education certificate examination, which will lead you into high school. Mm -hmm. So they will usually bring some earlier questions for you to test yourself before you meet the main exams. And we call it mock exam. It was during this exam, on, we were actually on the second paper. Then my mom died. Oh, no. Yes. So they wrote the rest of the exams without me. But trust me, I came back and I wrote, after the funeral, I came back and I wrote myself and my one of my brothers. And I, we wrote and I still beat a lot of them, <laughs> even in that trauma. 
So that was at the, the, the moment the toughness started after my mom was no more. But along the line, even before then, I realized that my mom did not have the capacity that she used to have, due to, partly due to the presence of my dad. Because like everything, the responsibility was now shifted on my dad. So she was a bit reluctant. Since the man is here, cannot champion so many things. So she relaxed. And things became, started coming down. So when she died, things became more tougher. Things became more tougher. I only got revived again. My most exciting moment again was when we wrote the BEC and I excelled as the best student with aggregate 17. It wasn't very good at the time, but in the village standard, that was really good grade. So that it was at that point my dad too started seeing the importance. So when they he even heard it before me, I was busy in the farm, I put in some grasses to go and feed pigs. When a young guy was passing and just told me, oh, congratulations, I was like, what is it for? I'm from school, your resource is in, and they say you were the best. So my dad heard it and he was so happy from that point that he realized that yes, we were heading somewhere in the education. So when I got to high school, between 2002 and 2005, even the admission fee was a problem at the time because it was now left with my dad. And we were two. One of my siblings was from a different mom. We completed together. So it was tough. If I tell you I couldn't get school uniform, the proper, the, the recommended school uniform for the high school, we couldn't afford that. So my brother had to go into the market, just look at the used clothes that they sell. We call it folks. And then look at the color. The school uniform used to be light green. He looked for something similar and bought it. And they did some alterations at the tailoring shop. Then he looked for the trouser, which was khaki color. Did same. So when I went, I was actually looking different from other students. And they used to, uh, some other students used to mock me. You know, from the village to the town for the first time, I was very timid. And getting into the class, I went there with the, that my best grade from the grade. I entered there and I realized I was having the worst grade in the whole class. People had far, far better grades. Why? What happened? There is a reason to that. There was an officer from my village who was in the education office. And I had chosen a particular school that I wanted to study science. But the grade I had did not qualify me for the science in that school. So they gave me home economics, which is about catering stuff. Mm -hmm. So when the man was sorting the document in the education office, he saw the grade and he was like, no, I know my village and I know the circumstances there. So if there's a kid there who manages to get this grade and he wanted to study science, I think he can make it. So he diverted me into the different school where they gave me the science. You see how nature does things. Wow. So I was sitting in the village. Then a, a car came and stopped by and they removed an envelope that uh, they said they should give this letter to. Then they mentioned my name. We opened and that was admission. So that was how I ended up in the science class with the worst grade. That man intervened there because he knew the capabilities of kids in his village. It was just that the teachers weren't there. Infrastructure and things were not very good. So if in the midst of all that, we could make such grades, then he knew we could make it. So that was how I had the worst grade. You, but you were very lucky. Like I'm just seeing your life that there seemed to be always at the right moment, the right. People. Yes, yes, like, you are right. Before that believed in you, that could see the good in you, your yeah. pure heart, eh? and they, yeah. they really stand up for you to push you. It always pays off. Wow. So I, in the through the second term, I was very timid actually, to be frank, because I was always looking different from other. I don't have proper uniform. So I was always looking different. And some were teasing me. Some were like, my friend, are you going to the farm? And I mean, but I was, I kept on pushing until one afternoon at the dining hall, they announced that students from my home parish, you know, the Catholic church, we have parishes. Mm -hmm. So students from my home parish, which was the last year parish, they announced that we should come and meet the school Beza. So when we got there, they said there was this, uh, organization there it was a church affiliated organization and they are paying the school fees for children from that parish so they had refunded the fees we paid hallelujah so that was the turnaround moment so i picked that money i remember it was 27 ghana cities at the time what's that in euros that's just a tiny amount but at the time it was huge wow so when i picked that money i quickly now went and bought myself the proper uniform <sighs> 
bought all the necessary things that I was supposed to have. Then it was left with seven CDs. I couldn't do anything with it. I just kept it in an envelope. And then one of my colleagues from my village was going on exit to, to visit home. I gave the envelope to him to go and give to my dad. Nice. So when I came home on the first vacation, my dad was like, ah, I mean, have they started paying you guys at the <laughs> senior high school? I was like, no, it's a sponsorship. So that was the turnaround. They paid our fees throughout. Wow. And you know one interesting thing? The most exciting moment in my high school, before I graduated from the worst grade in the class, I was among the top three out of the high school. Wow. I was among the top three, yes. Yep. And that also, that also led me into the university. <laughs> wow. What a story! And, but what I what I hear is that uh, this 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 church funds was that an international thing? Was it international yes. funds, or was yes. it was it Ghana government that started it's, to? Uh, I understand it's an international fund actually. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I I don't know much about it. I think it's uh, it's from either Germany or Canada. I'm not very sure. Mm -hmm. But there's an organization that is funding that from there, and it's still it it exists as we speak. It's still on. Even at my university, they still had a hand. They paid my fees. Mm -hmm. It was but tough. I find that interesting because uh, I see that a lot in Ghana. I see that a lot in African countries. That it's actually international so, NGOs that so. uh, do work. And me, I have a lot of prejudgmentals against this, to be honest, because a lot of That's times so. I see um, a big intervention from NGOs that come to help, but yes, they so. don't really know the deep the situation. The deep situation, huh? because they haven't been brought up there. They don't know the difficulties. They don't know what they create of jealousy or in terms of, I don't know. And they take the job of the government, right? Because normally yeah. it should be the government first priority next to health to yeah. educate their own country, right? And yeah. make, make education available for everyone. So yeah. Yeah. I'm always kind of be like torn but i mean it also feels good to see that i mean that that helped you so much at that time right you are you are very right you know i am always of the view that if the the western world or all those superpowers if they could the effort they put in providing sponsorships of programs for the poor countries if they put same effort in ensuring that the leaders of our countries work well Mm -hmm. And they are accountable. I mean, there will not be anything like poor nation and rich nation. Mm -hmm. We have everything it takes, yeah. but it's just in the hands of few. Yeah. And the West, they know this, but they will not intervene. They are only interested in coming down to help the poor. But I don't know, the day the thing becomes cyclical. We keep helping them, they get impoverished. But the, the, main, the cause of the main problem is that the root cause is that people are not, leaders are not accountable. Yeah. If you assist and make leaders accountable, the resources available are more than enough. Mm -hmm. So I share in your view in that regard. I wouldn't say because I benefited from such a thing, I would say it should just continue. It is not sustainable. If it's continue like that, then we will keep on being poor and poor and needing help all the time. All the time. When you want to offer help, I am of the view that if you want to offer help, you offer the right help. Did you ever feel poor? Oh, yes. Yes, because that was the moment I told you common food was a problem. Mm -hmm. After I finished, I completed high school. I got this uh, people teaching. I was doing some part-time teaching. And then I wanted to go and study laboratory technology mm -hmm. in one of the colleges. Unfortunately, it was very competitive and they turned me down. I had also made a mistake. I, that was the only form I bought for the year. That was 2006. So when I didn't get admission, I was down. I was just at home doing nothing. Now I was not doing the teaching. I was just at home. Man, it was tough. I, in my overall down, most down moment was encountered within that period. There was a night, the first time I told my wife this story, she cried very well. There was a night I was actually hungry the whole day and went on bed, empty stomach still. And with no hope of when the next meal was going to come, I was sweating. Bright moonlight, very airy, but I was just sweating and shivering out of hunger. I went to fetch water to drink. It didn't help me. There was a mango tree outside 
that had just started bearing fruits, very fresh. They were not mature. And white ladder is highly acidic, huh? But that was the only available thing I could lay my hands on. So I went and plucked one fruit, bit into it. When I swallowed it, I nearly vomited. And it gave me serious cramps. My tummy started paining severely. So I threw it away and went back to, to lie down. So I managed until daybreak. Where the next food came from, I can't even remember. But that thing has been registered in my head as the lowest moment ever in my life overall. I have my lowest moment at various stages, but overall, this thing I can never forget. And it really entered me. So at that moment, I felt like all was falling apart. There's no way I was going to make it in life. I have all this intelligence in me, I'm sure. I have good results. I could go to university. But if there is no common food for you to fill your stomach, how then do you start thinking about going to the university, Lena? Is it possible? So that was what was informing my feeling for being poor. But again, I don't know what kept pushing me. The following year, instead of filling forms for another college, I chose the university. I said this time, because the university, they don't conduct interview. Once you qualify, they admit you. So I didn't want to be disappointed. I filled the forms, and the admission came. Again, I was in the village when the admission came, because I had used my brother-in-law's address. So the admission came to him, and he just gave it to a transport driver to stop at my village and give it to us. So when they brought it, I was out uh, the roadside that day with some other guys. We had a camp there. When they brought it and they mentioned the name, I was there, ran and went and picked it, opened it was admission. That was another problem. That day, the admission, everybody was happy. When it was evening time, it was like funeral for the house. Where are they going to afford the fees from? So I wrote a letter and sent back to that organization that helped me during the high school time. And then I presented it. So when I got there, fortunately on my part, the director at the time, knew my family. My father's first wife was a relative to him. So he knew my mom was late and my dad was just late recently. So he knew the situation. But then he told me that the organization at the time were not sponsoring tertiary education. They were only sponsoring basic education. So I should go and look for the fees and pay. And then he will convince the organization if they see the need, then they will help me. You know, I replied to him. I told him, sir, if you really want me to go and look for a fees and pay, then you are indirectly telling me I should go and forgo the admission. I should just let it be. He took a deep breath and told me to go and come in three days time. When I went back in three days time, they signed me a check of 400 Ghana cities at a time. So it was just left with uh, two cities for me to pay the fees. I went to my brother-in-law at the time, and he also helped me with the two cities. So I just went and paid the fee. So my brother, my other siblings were at home lamenting, and I know everybody was just moody. Then I appeared from nowhere with a banker's draft that I had paid the fees. Then it rekindled some, it revived everybody, and they saw the need to support me. Then they made sure they paid my fees every year until I completed university. Wow. <laughs> wow, what yes. is great. How did you always believe you can make it? What did you, even in that hunger situation, even in that situation that you have not even two cities? I mean, like, like as a European, two cities, there must be someone who can give you these two cities. Number one, it was the story of my family. The family had been in poverty for so long, and it was like there was no way forward. So I had, I had, I had always had this feeling that no, things must change. And if things must change, no matter the circumstances, we should keep trying. So at that moment, I felt, hey, if you gain admission into the university, in the history of my family, I was the first to step foot into the university. No one has ever reached there. So I felt, no, this is an opportunity. So if I sit down lamenting, why don't I fight, get the admission? If I don't get help, the world will know that, yes, I have done my part. Because at the moment, I don't have fees. But I, I, I can fill the forms. And I can look for that admission. So let me look for it and see what God does. I just kept hoping. And it, it looks like your observation was right. At every point in time in my life, something always comes at the right time. That has always been my life story. So that was one driver. The second driver in me was my senior brother. After my parents passed on, he actually wanted, he dropped out of school because of the difficulties and what have you. He was ahead, but he dropped off to take care of those of us behind. 
So he had the chance to even travel abroad to Libya to go and hustle, but at the time he said no. Now if I leave, I am the only hope of these kids who have a very bright future. If I leave, then nothing is going to happen. So he rescinded his decision and stayed back. So he also fought. He was also the second driver, and he he was the disciplined aspect. Whenever we wanted to join the bandwagon, try to join other kids to do misbehavior, he will shape you and bring you online and make you know that Charlie, you have a dream ahead. So that was the second thing. Part of your story, I I still have to smile because I remember when you told me that uh, you went to Germany um, as a singer of a band, right? <laughs> and and yes. first, first, you never really sang. Second, you never really planned to go to Germany, right? No, but no. you know, be your friends, like you have some friends. They were always talking about going to Europe, and but yeah. but you were the one going. Like, can you tell me that story? Yeah, sure, sure. Uh, you know, I had uh, some of my co-workers. I know they will listen to this interview. We used to talk a lot about Charlie. The Ghana is tough, so we need to fight and get to Europe or America and then get better job there to do. So they were always struggling with this American lottery and stuff. And I was always reluctant, sitting on the fence. As they are doing, I'm busy typing something else. I'm not even kidding. So they were always like, man, are you so satisfied with the conditions in Ghana? And I'm like, man, I don't have any dream of working anywhere. If it comes, fine. But I'm not going to fight to go and be in a strange land that I'm not sure about. So they, they felt it was weird. I, I mean, so when the chance came and then I was going to Germany, it, it, used to, it used to be very funny to me. I was like, I mean, among my peers, I was the least interested in traveling abroad. And all of a sudden, I have traveled abroad before them. <laughs> I know they they will still go, but I have gone before them, and it was just very funny. <laughs> yeah, but that it was always just about my involvement. Um, I have something in me. When you give me a task, I first of all want to know what the impact is. Is it going to impact positively on lives or anything? If it is, do I have the capacity? If I have the capacity, I accept that is how I am. Even if I don't have the capacity, and I think I can do something about it, looking around, if I feel there is no one else that can probably do it the way I will do. I will be better off. Then I just accept. And I, I, there's one thing about me too. I like doing things my own way. For instance, you see, uh, if I were someone, you say you are coming to have this interview, as you should have seen me in suit and tie, I mean, looking so official. But look, I mean, look at what I'm wearing. I just like being me and doing things my own way. Yeah. I mean, we shouldn't, we shouldn't let rules restrict us so much to the point to the point that it is no more beneficial that is my my conviction and then subsequently i got the chance to visit germany for that three weeks and it was amazing yeah i mean you were <laughs> performing in berlin like it's like crazy it's it like... was even never part of the plan actually uh, i'm part of the committee but i was never part of the band i helped them a lot during the uh, recorded in, in, in Kalba here. So just to tell everyone, like you have a band in Kalba, right? And it's it's like it's 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 a group of different musicians and they were invited to perform. Like you produced an album with some international yes. guys with Sony. Yes. yes and yes. you were like invited to go on a tour and present your new album, right? Your new sure, CD. Sure. And sure. you were part of the community, but you were not part of the band at that time when you were going no. to Germany. I wasn't part of that, but I was just like, a, if I could put it, like the spokesperson. Uh -huh. Someone that can join the group to always tell the story behind what we're doing, because we're doing that music to bring developmental projects back to Kalba. So that story needs to be told. Actually, the first time I went on stage, it was the, during our first performance. You know, uh, going to Europe for the first time, I was feeling very cold, even in all those jackets. So I felt like, no, let me get up and start dancing. I'm, I'm the worst dancer in the whole world, you know. But I started doing my own thing. And gradually, gradually, people, you know your people, right? The Germans, they are always serious with their bottle of beer and watching. Before I realized, <laughs> people started nodding and joining me, one, one. So that was it. Anywhere we went, I just started dancing to keep myself warm. And people saw it so nice. I think a couple approached me after the first show. Hey, we don't usually see this in Europe here. Everybody is, I mean, serious with work. We are stressed out. We, I mean, we drink our beer and that is all. We don't. But look at how you just started dancing, uninvited. You were just so happy, just doing your own thing. It's not usual. So that, that's just it. And eventually, I, was, I found myself behind the microphone and also singing.
<laughs> because according to Sonny, my voice is deep and he just loved it. And that was it. <laughs> and you were even performing in front of hundreds of people, right? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I think at Zulpis, we performed in front of about 300 people or so. Believe me, before we ended the show, the entire hall was dancing. Nice. Yes. <laughs> So you got a feeling for our culture. And I know there's a lot of Germans also in Ghana, but it's always different to see Germans in their own environment, like getting a feeling for the vibes, for the cities you've been touring around. So you've got a lot of experience in a, in a quite short time. Sure. First, I want to know, uh, what do you think we Germans can learn from Ghana? This thing of just being happy yourself, I see that is highly missing. That is my observation. So if there is anything I will ask them to learn and it will help them, they should just learn to happy themselves. Nobody in this world will make you happy. Even if the person comes to make you happy and you still decide not to be happy, it's a decision from within. Just tell yourself that I want to, I mean, I want to enjoy myself. And then it's, it's like that. I don't know how to explain for you to understand, but you just start flowing here. As I said, if the music starts playing here, Even at the working environment, I can just start dancing. I mean, dancing and working, and nobody takes me on. It's, it's accepted. And that's the only way you can distress your mind. But when it's only work, 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 and you have this feel that somebody somewhere will come and provide me entertainment, man, forget it. Forget it. You have to create it within yourself. That self-satisfaction within yourself. Well, that's a really big thing, huh? Thank yeah. you a lot for sharing because that's exactly also how I feel. I sometimes when you're so down and what I always when I travel in any African country, I think it's a big skill that people have to change the perspective in their mind and just yes. happy in the moment. Like sure. you have nothing to eat, you don't know where the next money is coming from. Yeah. But there's a there's an empty pot, there's like a stick, someone sure. starts to, to drum on it and you have a party and it creates a special energy that also makes you moving forward, I think, that brings you over the down to the next up, right? Sure, 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 sure. That's very what, important. What was your expectation going to Germany and did the expectation meet the reality? Uh, yes and no. As for the environment, my expectation was 100% as I expected because I see it in pictures every now and then. So when I, when I got there, it was exactly as it is, apart from the fact that I was feeling the environment in my skin. But the pictorial sense in my head was exactly as I thought of. But what shocked me was the, the behavior of the people in Germany. You know, we have this negative impression, Germans are racist. Growing up, we hear this a lot. They, when you even get there, they look at you, they will come and touch your skin and look at the color, whether it's charcoal or something. They don't respect you and all that. I got there and I never had a single situation like that. So that was the first shock. Secondly, I thought they were a group of arrogant people. I got there and I saw, look, you can never differentiate who is rich and who is poor in Germany. Do you know, uh, when we go to uh, Zulpis for the last, the, the show that I said we entertained about 300 people, we finished the show and then we went for a snack. And there was this gentleman that was serving us with his wife and then the daughter. Then Tim told me that was the mayor of the city. I was like, what? In Africa, before you can see this man, you come with army. So just and police escort. I mean, I mean, it will be a big thing, you know. He will be accompanied by others. And he's here, fold, folded his sleeves, and he's serving a snack with his wife and daughter. I was like, wow. If there is anything that shocks me and beats my expectation, then this is it. Wow, how beautiful. Yeah, people are so humble. You don't even know who is rich. The rich, the, the very rich are hiding themselves. People do donations and it's anonymous. It's not usual. In Ghana, when we do the list of things, you know, we have to make noise and massage our ego, let them know that we are doing the big things, you know. Mm -hmm. But over there, it's not like that. Somebody comes to donate a huge money and it's, don't mention my name, I don't even want to be known. It's like, wow. So that was the aspect that beat my imagination, if you ask me. Yes. People are um, generally humble. 
Yeah. That yeah. is very beautiful to hear about my own country. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, that, is, that was really unexpected to hear so much good. And yeah. uh, thanks a lot. I would like to hear when you wake up in the morning, like yes, what yes. makes you jump out of bed? Uh, the bigger goal is that somebody is not left out in the society or those that I serve. No one should be left out. And there, even if someone is left out, the reason shouldn't be me. So this is the thing that is always in my head. It's a bit when like, I wake up. Huh? Like your mom serving everyone with food. Yes, yes. They, I, I, I have this belief that uh, the nearest people around you, if you can impact in their life, or if you are contributing positively to them, then you are contributing to the world. The world is not an item sitting somewhere. The world is a whole of which my environment is a part. Mm -hmm. So it's like different functions of the body parts coming together to form the human being. So if I am here and I'm supposed to do certain things to those who are not privileged to acquire the skills I have, then I need to be on top of my game. I don't have to sit and not be expecting someone and putting all the blames. So as we push blames, but you make sure you fulfill your part of the, the dream that you want to, to, to achieve. So that is what drives me. When I wake up, the next thing that clicks my mind is, what next? Is there anything outstanding that I didn't do yesterday? That is always the first thing. And sometimes those things wake me up in the middle of the night. When I have an unfinished business, I don't sleep well. When I'm sleeping, you keep ringing, hey, you have this to be done, you have this to be done. And I'm anxious, I can even lose appetite for that. Until it gets done. When it is done, then you find me relaxed and I can even sleep in the hot afternoon. <laughs> Wow. So these are the things that pushes me. These are the things that push me. And not with very huge things, even if it is a little thing. Getting up to go and greet somebody who is sick and the person seeing you and smiling. But that one, I think, is an achievement. For that day, if you sit back at the close of day and you reflect, then you become proud that you have made someone smile at least. <laughs> yes. But as I'm sitting now, I can also assure you that the next five, ten years, I'm going to be a nutritionist. If something else comes and I feel, okay, if I fit in this capacity again, I'm going to help another problem. Off, I'm gone. That is how I am. I don't allow plants to restrict me. That's my nature. So that's why you find me always doing so many things. I'm, I want to learn almost everything and a bit of everything. And, and eventually becoming a master of none. <laughs> but it's really inspiring because I feel like that you always, you are always yourself. You always follow yes. who you are. You stay positive, you serve, like you 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 donate your time and your your what you learned to share it with other people and the good comes back to you without you expecting it, right? You yeah, give yeah, and yeah. you let go and at one point yeah, you're yeah. surprised what's ending in front of your door. Yes. And that makes your life also very interesting, right? Yeah, that you don't yeah, yeah. I feel like you don't have this goal and your whole priority is to reach the goal. Uh, yes. Yeah, you have a good year <laughs> and you go for it, uh, but you enjoy sure. the ride, you still look right and left, you serve others, you, you create sure. community, sure. and sure. then sure. more doors open unexpectedly, right? Sure. So, sure. Sure. But, sure. but who, who inspires you? Like, I mean, who are your gurus? Because I feel like the wisdom that you collected along the way, some people in Europe, they go to big coaches, they go to spiritual leaders where do you actually see acknowledge like wh what makes you grow uh like you said i think uh, it would be the internet if you ask me now gone with the days when i don't know something i ask someone now i can just research on the internet uh, but you know one funny thing if i'm saying this if anybody hears this uh, those who know me when they hear this they'll be shocked i have never sat in an it class before throughout my education the first time I tapped the power button of a computer was at the university. <laughs> it was for my roommate. I was in second year, actually. That was the first time I touched a computer with my finger like this and kept it on and held the <laughs> mouse to do something. Keep learning. I'm always learning. I'm always learning. When I find something interesting, I learn. Even sometimes I forgo my sleep. In the midnight, you find me learning deeper and deeper. And the more I learn, the more I get those things. And when someone comes to me, uh, Ima, do this for me. I don't say I cannot do. I just say, okay, you bring it. Let me see what I can do. After you are gone, then I go back to try to research. So I had a friend in Calva here who told me that I was, 
I was I was wasting my talent because things like setting of phones, people have issues with phones. Instead of me charging them and working on it, I do. And I, I told him that no. I see that I'm rather they are pushing me to learn and improving in my life rather than me collecting small money from them. So sometimes I use my own data to do something for them. And people are like, man, why? Are, are you are you insane? But the guests don't know. When you bring me your problem, it forces me to learn. As you are away, I learn and I solve it for you. The next time I see similar problem, I don't need to learn. I've already witnessed it. Then I'll just do it. And the person's like, wow, where did you learn this? Self-taught. So that is just it. But my major, my, my main, my, uh, you ask me who I look up to. If you ask me who I look up to, it is my late mom, actually. If you ask me who is my life coach and what have you, that woman who is dead and gone long since 2002, so many years ago, I still look back at her and then she's the inspiration in me that gets me doing a whole lot of things because she wasn't formally educated, but the life she lived and up to date, when I go to my village, you still find people telling me more stories about her that I didn't know. She has always been one of the, my, my you know, invisible coaches in life. And I still listen to her a lot. Yes. What is the biggest thing uh, you would want your children to understand about life? The biggest thing I would want my children to understand about life is to laugh. And actually, that is the name I gave to my first daughter. Her name is Laugh People. No, never. In the garden, no, never means Laugh People. Then my second child, I gave him the name Emalo, which means be a blessing. Do not be the reason why somebody is sad or somebody is hurt. Always be a blessing to people. Let someone, when they hear your name, then the person smiles, even if the person is in pain. So these are the values me I, I go by. So I always tell my kids, even though they are very young, when you grow, I'm not going to restrict you. I don't have dreams for them. I'm just doing my best to educate them. Whatever I didn't get, I'm providing it, trying my best to provide it for them now. But when they grow, the decision is theirs. Whatever path they've chosen, I'm not going to interfere. They should just be their best to society. That's all. What, what is the biggest thing you would change in Ghana that would improve the life of Ghanaian people? The biggest thing, if I get the chance, is our perception. Everybody think, let's go to West and make money, make dollars, make euros. That is not the case. If we change our mindset with what is available here, in the next few years, the West will come and borrow money from us. I believe so. That, that's that. If you ask me what to change is our perception. We have the perception that we are poor and there's nothing that can be done. And the whites, the Western world is rich and we must rely on them. That's the perception I just want to see changed. If we change that, we I think we have enough. Selfishness is what is killing us. Wow. Is it yes. selfishness and jealousy? Yes. Is it yes. And where do you see the root of that? Why why is the mindset like this? Why why do so many people are so greedy and selfish? Yes, because it's, uh, I will bring that one to the doorstep of the politicians, our leaders. They get there, we elect them, and then instead of them serving us, they are enriching themselves and painting a different picture to us. You understand? They are painting a, painting a different picture to us. They are telling you the economy is growing. We are doing well. We are growing your economy. But you don't see it reflect in your immediate environment. Mm -hmm. People get up and they cannot, they cannot add, uh, afford three square meal a day. Under nutrition everywhere. Children, women suffering. And then you are living big in the, in the, in the community when you come. They live in the most luxurious buildings. They are chasing after luxury when the majority of the population is actually chasing after basic needs. Like I told you, there was a point in my life when basic need was like luxury for me. Yeah. Basic need was a luxury. So I did, as I said now, basic needs, I can afford it with the ease that I want. That's why uh, when you told me this interview is going to be done from zero to hero, I laughed. And I was like, uh, I'm not up there. That is why you are referring to me as a hero, but I have overcome a lot and I am where I am today. So that is it. They do this things and we see, the young people see. So people are like, oh, there's no need even going to school that much. Just join the politicians. Once, if you get a portfolio, then you can loot more money and make yourself powerful. So they always try to build their empire around their families. And that is it. And the masses keep suffering. So everybody have that ambition. 
that once I want to be, become better, then I, unless I join the political class, that's why it keeps re recurring. And the young ones are watching. He sits down and he sees the president passes, a minister passes, an MP passes, and there is a fleet of vehicles following. Then they are there jumping in that excitement. Who is it? Then they mention the name. It's registered in the head that if I want to be that powerful, then it unless I pass through there. So when they grow and they are not able to get that, and they see, uh, you know, these are our brothers who go to the West where the job, the payments of salaries are better there. They make money, come back when they change the foreign currency into the local currency. They have plenty of money. Then even though if they, they are out there, they will not reach any class, but they come back here and they are on top there. So people are also of the view that, hey, if you want to make it and go abroad, go to the West, that's where you can work, make more money. But I don't believe in that. I just, I'm just fine working in my environment, trying to make it better. Uh, if a time comes and there's the need, if there's really the need, fine. Like the way we went there, unexpected, fine. But to go and settle in Europe and just work throughout. Uh, and usually, trust me, when I mention this, a lot of my colleagues here see me as a non-serious. They're like, this guy, he doesn't have a vision. You mean if you get a chance? A couple of people have asked me, you have links with whites all the time. We see you with whites, white guys. Why don't you just fight and move your family? And I'm always like, no, that's not my priority. My priority is not to go and make plenty of dollars and come and put up mansions. My priority is the little things I do that make me happy, my internal self, that's all. If I go there, the coal alone is enough frustration for me because that's not my natural environment. I will just be struggling to cope. So why don't I just remain here? I mean, now I'm employed, I'm serving people, and I'm earning a decent income that can take care of the basic needs of my family. I mean, the luxury, if God wants me to get a luxury, they will come in the future. If they come, I will not say no, but I'm not going to use my whole life chasing after luxury, no. What would you advise everyone that is in a zero point in life and that has a big frustration in life and doesn't really see uh, the green? Like, what would you advise these people? My advice to anybody who's feeling that they are at the zero is, uh, is that, first of all, they are not at zero. It's just that it's just a feeling. They are feeling that they are at a zero. They feel so mostly because they don't have some earthly material things. They want to happen. They don't have it. But deep within you, you are not zero. You yourself, you are the one that can make yourself better. So my advice to such people is that, one, always do the necessary things. What you are supposed to do, what is your responsibility? Do it. Do it with all your heart and leave the rest to nature. Even if you don't believe in God, I always tell people this. If you don't even believe in God, but the nature that we are found, we found ourselves in has a way of paying people, which some people say karma, right? Mm -hmm. So such, my, such people, I will tell them, always do what is necessary of you and leave the rest. Just allow nature to take it course. It, nature will always find a way of rewarding you. But when you base on the fact that certain things are not happening, then you let go of your own responsibility. Then it doesn't help you. So that's the advice for them. Do what is required of you and leave the rest. Uh, Thank you so much. That's so powerful. One more thing. If you die tomorrow, what do you want to be remembered for? I just want my children to remember me for the love I had for them and for teaching them how to live a happy life and a peaceful life and not teaching them how to run after wealth. Because as young as I am, But I've seen a lot of grown-ups who are regretting now. They have everything you can think of. They can afford everything. They have all the luxury. They are not happy. They sleep and they cannot sleep. They can't even get three-hour normal sleep that I get. So I, it's only at that point that they realize that, no, I was chasing after this thing, thinking that it is only that one that will make me happy. But now that I have everything, I realize that there is more to happiness. Mm -hmm. And, I mean, without happiness in life, you have just passed through, but you have not encountered this earth. You need to be happy. I always tell people that at this my age, God forbid, but if I die now, you will find my corpse smiling because I feel I have lived. I'm not waiting for life to live in the future. I'm living life as I live. That is all. So that's what I want my children to remember me for teaching them. If I'm able to imbibe this in them, I will be the happiest soul. Wow, Emma, thank you so much. <laughs> thank you so much. I mean, there's so many more questions I have to you, but for now, <laughs> I'm so grateful for for the sharing, for for the love. I'm just so grateful for having me on your on your show.
Thank you so much. Say hi yes. to your family. Take care. Hello, hello to my family and all the people in Calva and Ga and Jirapa side there. Yes. <laughs> Thanks from Morocco. <laughs> Bislama. <laughs> hey, bye bye. Ciao. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you like and subscribe. Share it with your friends and family. If you have questions, get in touch with me at Lena Lost Africa on Instagram. Thanks for listening. See you in the next episode. <laughs>